found you in your house at the close of the day. Lord, we want to thank you that it is you who have ordained a day of rest for us, that after six days of labor, that we should be found in your house resting in worship of you, Lord. <coughs> Lord, we want to thank thee the way that you have provided for us, protected us, you guided and helped us throughout this week. Lord, in our work, in our family commitments, in our studies, and in other our various journeys, Lord. Truly, Lord, as we begin each day in you, we thank you that we could end it in you too. Lord, as we live our lives on this earth, we have the hope of eternity rising in our hearts every day. Lord, the hope that, Lord, one day we will see you face to face. Lord, we want to thank you for the way that you move us, you direct us towards that hope, Lord. Lord, as we come before thee, Lord, we realize how unworthy we are, Lord, to receive all the good things from your hands, Lord. Yet, Lord, as a father, Lord, reaches out to his children, Lord, you reach out to us. And as a father chastens his children when they do wrong, Lord, you do chasten us all because you love us, Lord. And Father, we ask you now in this hour to search all our hearts, Lord. Father, we may wash us and cleanse us of all sins, Lord, <coughs> and sanctify us that we may be holy as you are holy. Lord, I want to thank you for each and every brother and sister, the young ones and adults who are gathered in your house this evening. Lord, may your blessings rest upon them. Lord, may you be with them in the coming week, the <coughs> studies, the exams, the work commitments, family responsibilities, uh, church ministries. Oh Lord, may you bless your people, Lord. Lord, as we read in this psalm, Lord, when the good Lord is our shepherd, we shall lack nothing, Lord, in life. Oh Lord, for you know the path that we need to go. And so you train us, Lord, when it is by the green pastures or by the still waters. Or when, Lord, times when we need to go down, down into the valley of the shadow of death. Lord, we know that you are with us. You will see us through, Lord. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you for being our lifelong <coughs> companion, Lord. One who never sleeps, nor slumbers. One who is always watching over us, Lord. Oh, Lord, this time we come. Lord, we are weak. Lord, we are vulnerable. Lord, we are aware that the devil is like a roaring lion, Lord, seeking to devour us. But Lord, when as we hear his fearsome roar, Lord, as we hear of his, the, the, the snares that he has laid before us, Lord, teach us, O oh Lord, to focus on thee and to run the race that you have set before us to fight the good fight. Oh, Father, in this your name, I pray that you will bless your servant Dr. to you as you brought your word. I pray you will anoint your servant and speak to us, Lord. Oh, teach us the words of faith and duty, O oh Lord. Teach us, Father. And thank you for the offering of people that have given, Lord. May you bless this offering and may you use it for the furtherance of your kingdom. We especially want to commit Reverend Money as he embarks on his mission trip next week for a week that you will go before him and he does.
flesh, the world completion. We thank thee, becoming ourselves in the loving things. In Jesus' name. The scripture reading for today is taken from 2nd Peter, chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. 2nd Peter, chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. Chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of, and through covetousness shall they refrained words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them in the chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned with condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivereth just Lord, waxed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them, in seeing and hearing, waxed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanliness and despise government, presumptuous are they, self-willed, they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. May God bless the reading of his word. We will now proceed on to memory verse. The memory verse for today is taken from Proverbs chapter 15. Verse 16. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 16. Let's all read this together. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 16. Better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. Let us take a few moments to memorize this verse. Okay, we are ready to close our Bibles and let's say this together. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 16. Better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. Amen. Before we proceed to the message, let's sing another hymn. Like a river glorious.
wear a false stitches, it's not even a real button as well. Mm. You know, in some churches, not this one of course, uh, when the moderator passes the children to leave, I feel like I'm losing half my congregation, but it's, it's okay here. Uh, so we pray and <coughs> come to God's word. Lord, as we continue in our worship, uh, our expressions of our devotion, may there a sense of your holy presence here, that we can sense it in, in our spirit and, and through our bodies, that there is something that's palatable, and that uh, would encourage us that you are ever with us, and that you will not forsake us, that you are ever faithful. And this evening, as we look at this topic of truth versus falsehood, may we be forewarned and armed that we are the, uh, not only the recipients of truth, we need to be the guardians of it as well. So your name we pray. Uh, amen. As uh, I've been here now almost, uh, well, this is my seventh year in Singapore, and one of the things I knew before coming here, but was confirmed once I arrived, was that um, in some places, you, you go there, you walk on the streets, people know you're not from around there. So when I go around, walking around, uh, I blend in, because there's a, it's a wide variety of different ethnic uh, representations, you know, be, be either uh, Chinese or even some Koreans, um, uh, people from uh, Indian uh, background, as well from Malaysia, Indonesia, and so on. So there is a very healthy uh, mix of not only ethnicities, but certainly traditions, uh, languages, customs, as well as uh, religions, different religions. And um, I do recognize and appreciate the government's policy to maintain the Religious Harmony Act. And so being Christians um, in a sea of different faiths, we might think that one of the threats to our, our the purity and practice of our faith is the presence of other religions, of other practices and beliefs and, and what have you. While that may be the case, I think maybe of a greater threat is what Singapore represents, what it is so good at. You know, um, this year we're celebrating uh, SG50, and so you see the various documentaries of what it was like 50 years before, how it used to be a, a, a backwater uh, fishing village where it's a swamp land with basically nothing there. And in the span of a generation, it becomes a first world global economy. And so one of the things is it's not a religion, but it becomes a, a practice, a, a belief. It's maybe a philosophy of life that is ingrained in the people. For us to maintain our competitive edge, we ourselves we need to be competitive, realizing that we are the number one resource that this country has in order for it to maintain that uh, position within um, the, the global uh, community of uh, various, uh, uh, various nations and so forth. And that being the case, then you have this mantra, you keep hearing this over and over again, that whether it be in the school, on the, on the airwaves, or in the marketplace, that we need to be ambitious. We need to be a very driven people. Uh, we need to work hard, to have clearly defined goals. Education is a, is a priority. And one of the things I was impressed was that on weekends, the first year, I always was puzzling, why are there school children wearing the uniforms with their backpacks? Isn't school out on weekends? Well, yes and no. Yes and no, the regular school is over, but then there's a special tutor that, that's ongoing, so they're ever on, on, on the uh, cutting edge of, of being learners. Even after uh, people finish formal education, they're still learning in order to maintain that edge in the marketplace. So it's about having a big dream, of being ambitious, of being driven, of working hard, of working long hours, of being a little bit better than the next person sitting next to you in order to arrive. So, you know, priority in education, of having a good career. And so what you learn and what people in some ways kind of worship because they put a premium on it is that what is success? 
Success is when you're climbing the corporate ladder, when you've gotten that ideal, that dream job, and you're earning the big bucks, and you have all the trappings of success. And so this, I think, more than anything else, represents a uh, primary threat to our faith. Because it is so prevalent. Everyone is thinking, believing, and doing it, including other Christians. We might be lowered in the false sense of, okay, those values, those practices and principles um, that this country that is using as, as a foundation to build it's, uh, and achieve greatness, it becomes my values, my convictions, my principles, and my priorities. And then we need to stop and think, is this Christian? Is this found in scripture? Or is there a possible conflict of interest? Now, having said that, I'm not saying that Singapore necessarily is the evil empire. I'm not saying that at all. Uh, there's a lot of good to it, but I am saying, based on, as we look at this passage in, uh, that our, our brother has read there, we need to be discerning. We need to look at balance and see the things that are declared illegal is good and successful and getting a thumbs up. Does that prove be consistent with the values that the kingdom maintains, that the scriptures uh, uh, teach? And so the first point I want to draw is that we need to be aware of false teaching and beliefs that serves as a threat to the purity of our faith to the church. And that's certainly found in the three, first three verses here, where it talks about the false prophets and the false teachers who teach and introduce destructive heresies. And again, we're not necessarily false religion, but anything that would drive us away from God, that puts distance, that can then be a threat to the well-being of, of the church because we're founded on the truth. And so we need to ask, well, what is the truth according to, to Scripture? So we need to be discerning. Now notice that verse 1 begins with the uh, word but. And so what that says is that what follows in these verses in chapter 2 is a contrast that what went before. So we look at chapter 1 at the end of it, and we see in particular in verse 20 and 24, it talks about prophecy and prophets whom the Lord has sent. And it talks about the interpretation of Scripture, the interpretation of prophecy, it needs to be consistent with what God intends the meaning to be, and not to come up with our own interpretation. And so that's the contrast. So what it is is that in chapter 1 ends with, so this is the truth, it's according to God's word as God intended. But there will be those who would take scripture and twist it around and come up with their own interpretation which would prove false. And so that's what Peter means by destructive heresies here. And so uh, I'm thinking, well, can we think uh, of a modern day example of a, um, a false teaching or what have you? Uh, a number of years ago, when I was still in the States, once in a while I would turn on my television and to the channel, but to particular religious broadcasts. I suppose there are religious broadcasts here in Singapore too. So uh, I was doing this uh, one, one weekend, Sunday evening, and it was broadcast from New York City. And the, the speaker that evening was a man by the name of Reverend Ike. And uh, one of the things I noticed right away was he was a very smooth communicator. Uh, he didn't use notes, he simply flowed, uh, and he was very humorous. And as the camera was, was paying the audience, it was a mixed audience, a pretty large, fair size uh, representation of, of at least several hundred people, if not more. Uh, people who were uh, Caucasians, people who were Afro-Americans, and there were some Asians and what have you. And so that was very, very impressive. Um, and that, so that was nothing I noticed from, from, the, from that broadcast. But as I listened to the content of his message, 
He was proclaiming what we would call the prosperity gospel. And as he was speaking, he was modeling the prosperity gospel. You know, um, speakers sometimes use their hands for gestures, and my brother was one of those. And so when he would uh, use his hands and wave it around as he spoke, the rings on his fingers would flash because of the, of the lighting there, the, the term lighting, what have you. And, you know, we're all born with ten fingers, well, most of us are born with ten fingers. And he must have had at least ten rings, at least one per, per, uh, per, per, per finger. And some of these were large stones. And so obviously the larger the stone, the more brilliant and more shiny it was. And then he had a diamond brooch that uh, uh, held it in tie in place. And I think he had a diamond earring too. So he was a walking showcase, uh, like somebody from the jewelry store, in one of those models. Right? Had it all, you know, kind of thing. And so he was a walking advertisement of this version of the gospel. And he would have people come up and give testimonies how with, with more faith they were able to get straight A's in school or get that promotion or, or, or got healing from sickness. And so his gospel was basically like this. You need faith to be, to be healed. You need faith to get rich. You need faith to get answers to your prayers. And so focus of his version of the gospel was that if you have sufficient faith, then you'll be blessed materially with various possessions, you know, new home, car, clothes, rings, you know, kind of thing there. And so the danger was that as, as attractive as that was, as compelling uh, as, it, as it may have been, what he had emphasized, the material tended to underemphasize and put in the background the spiritual aspect of life, of the spiritual blessing that God has intended and promises in the scripture. And what was also being emphasized was pursuing a personal relationship with the Lord and a fostering fellowship relationship with brothers and sisters in Christ in order to build up uh, the church that will provide a corporate witness, you know, as light and salt. And so that certainly would be uh, something that uh, you see even in Singapore, where uh, various versions of the prosperity gospel is also proclaimed. And even if uh, your fellow you know, citizens who are here who are not necessarily Christians, they practice a form of the prosperity gospel too. They're pursuing material blessings. And so then the question is, if we profess Christ, if we are encouraged to read the scriptures. Are we going to read it from God's perspective or from the world's perspective? Are we interested in the truth that transforms or are we simply interested in a truth, quote unquote, that will get us further ahead? Is our focus more on ourselves and what I can get out of life? Or is the focus more on the Lord and whether He will be honored through my decisions? and through my lifestyle and in conduct and so on. And so again, false teachings and false teachers that represent a threat. And so they come in various garbs, not necessarily religious, and they're very secular. And because it's so prevalent, you know, you see it on, 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 on TV, um, you go to the movies, um, you go out on Orchard Road or what have you, it's, you see it you know, everywhere. And what becomes so dominant what becomes so familiar can become less and less threatening to the point where we let our guard down. And we get so used to it, we're no longer alarmed or concerned that maybe this is leading us away from the Lord and making us blind to what is the truth. And so we need to be ever vigilant, uh, ever um, uh, going back to the scripture. Without doing that, we can lose our bearings, our frame. Of reference. As we continue in uh, verse 4 to 6 here, I, I would say that here uh, I could summarize those verses that where God will condemn those who are false teachers, false prophets, and those who follow their false teachings. And in this uh, passage here, uh, Peter brings out a number of examples of 
uh, this, this principle of those who are, he would classify as the ungodly or the wicked, and how God deals with them in contrast to how God deals with the righteous. And so you see the example of him mentioning uh, the angels when they sin in verse 4. How God has confined them to darkness and reserved them to the day of judgment. And then he goes on in verse 5, talks about God did not spare the ancient world. And so he mentions a reference to the flood and to Noah. And you go back to Genesis 6 and recall the, the story of Noah and the flood. You realize that God looked at the world, looked at mankind, and basically kind of threw up his hands and said, this is really, really bad. And the only way to, to get things right is to just do a complete sweep and wipe mankind off the face of the, off, off the earth and start over again. And so that's what he did. And it seems kind of extreme, but it, sh it shows you just how bad things are. And I'm so thankful that at the end of it all, God swore he would not do it that way again. So uh, we won't have to worry about flood. We just have to worry about caves, and that, that's all we need to worry about, you know. What's that compared to the flood, right? Uh, so so uh, what Peter is, is saying that, okay, there were uh, the bad angels. God will not ignore them, but he will deal with them. And there were the wicked among mankind, and so God deals with them as well. And then finally he mentioned the, uh, the episode with Sodom and Gomorrah, how uh, God sent a fire in order to obliviate uh, that generation uh, there. And so again, through these examples, what Peter is emphasizing is that God will definitely deal with all forms of wickedness and evil, particularly those who would pervert the truth, those who would deny his worship in their lives, who would exercise an evil influence on others. And so it's very clear that God is a very holy God. The God of justice, and He's not going to allow things to be as um, to remain as it is. Although um, they did have a chance uh, to repent, those who were ungodly refused, and because of their um, hardened hearts and uh, uh, unrepentant spirits, God finally had to execute judgment. So there's a period of grace, yes, but it's not infinite. It's not like forever. So God will not put up with wickedness forever. Uh, there's going to come a time when. A person has crossed the line to the point of no return. And at that point, they will face certain punishment because of, of their guilt. As we, we move on, um, you look at in verses 7 and 8, where instead of now focusing on God judging and punishing the wicked, now Peter addresses God's dealings and relationship with the righteous. And in doing so, it uses an example righteous lot. Now you might think, well, Lot was such a great fellow after all. Um, when his uncle Abraham asked him, okay, well, look at the, look at the uh, land before us. Um, your um, holdings, your livestock and, and sheep and land uh, is, is so, 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 so great and so am I. We can't share the same plot of land. So we need to separate up. So I'm going to give you first choice. Now that's very unusual. You know, because Abraham, being older and being uh, relationally his uncle, should have had first choice. And Lot should have been a lot more Asian than, than he was. He should have said, you should have deferred to uh, uncle, um, you're older, uh, you should have first choice. So you decide, and then I'll take what's left over. But no, he was too eager to pass up on this opportunity, so he seized the chance and said, I want this valley here, being so rich, you know, flowing with you know, milk and honey and what have you. And so he's, again, thinking only of himself. But in spite of those shortcomings, even though he wasn't perfect, yet by comparison to his neighbors in Sodom and Gomorrah, he came out looking like a slum of a rose. He was certainly very, very righteous. And so Peter is able to use him as an example of what we who are righteous, we who are the people of God, we who recognize the Lord as our God, who strive to read His Word from His perspective, to discern what is truth and hold on to that, and that which is we discern as false, we throw out the window and we reject, 
That's who is classified as the righteous. Not necessarily perfect or sinless, but someone who at least acknowledges the Lord as uh, as a, a lot does. Now, I want to quickly review what Peter defines as those who are righteous by looking back in chapter 1 where he mentions a list of characteristics of someone who is righteous. So back to chapter 1 and we're going to look at verses 5 to 7. I'm just going to mention all of the attributes. Um, so Peter lists them out here. Beginning in verse 5, faith, goodness, knowledge. Then in, in uh, verse 6, add on to self-control, perseverance, and godliness. Then in verse 7, he added mutual affection and, uh, and, and love. And so these would be, I would say, it reads really like uh, the fruit of the Spirit. You know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and, and, and so on. So these are key attributes that should be very evident in the life of that someone who is righteous. And when that is true, then God will look at that person and say, you are righteous. And so what he's, Peter mentions in, in back to chapter 2, verses 7 to 10, applies to that person. And so the, one of the challenges for us this evening is, well, if there are two kinds of people in the world, those who are righteous <coughs> and those who are wicked, which category am I? Not in my own assessment, but from God's evaluation. Uh, whom does he think that I am? Am I righteous or the wicked? Then I know which verses apply to me. And so Peter does not leave us in ignorance. He tells us, go back to chapter 1 and saying, if what is described as the righteous, you see it in your own life, at least it's forming may not be perfectly developed, but at least you're growing and developing in these areas, and you're conscientiously trying to pursue these expressions of godliness, then you're classified as righteous. So that's why Luke, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to totally get it all together and get everything working just right. But so long as you have the right attitude, and so long as you're respectful about scripture, that you interpret the way God would interpret it, the call true, what is what he calls true, and the call false, what he calls false, and you acknowledge his worship in your life, and you submit to his authority, then you are righteous. And certainly one of the things, as, uh, you know, that sounds like a lot of stuff to keep in mind. Let me simplify. All you need to remember is, so long as I strive to be like Christ, keep it simple. You focus on that, then all these other things that, he, that Peter mentions in detail will naturally start to develop in your life. So am I becoming more like Christ as I read the scriptures, practice this very spiritual disciplines, and go about life? And so back to here in verses 7 to 10, the key thought that comes out here is that God knows those who are righteous. And he treats them special by protecting them. He doesn't pull them out of the world. He leaves them in the world, just like Lot was living for a time in Sodom. Not, a, not the best of places. But God was able to preserve and protect Lot because he was someone he, uh, God considered as righteous. And so, if you are righteous, God will see that and then he will treat you uh, a certain way. That is certainly the opposite of the way he treats the wicked. So even now, even though there's some um, eschatology, the like end time ideas here, where we're talking about you know, a person's eternal faith, uh, eternal judgment versus eternal bliss. I'm talking about life like right now, today, God well, already, you know, kind of like a sheep and a goat, uh, in, in, a, in a manner of speaking, where he separates out those who are righteous and those who are wicked in terms of how he treats them. And in this passage, again, Peter uses 
uh, lot as, uh, as the example here. And you go back to the, to the early chapters of Genesis, you'll read that you know, he had two daughters, and he was living uh, in, um, in, in the outskirts of, of Sodom. And what Peter is saying, he was constantly grieved in his inner spirit. Because as he saw the conduct of his wicked neighbors, it was simply the contrast of night and day. And this wore heavily upon him. And the very fact that he was bothered by all this is a testament that he was righteous. Because if you're living in a place like Sodom in Gomorrah, and you don't feel anything, you feel everything is normal, that is a bad sign that you have been so ingrained and integrated in, into the, the world that you no longer distinguish what is of God and what is not of God, but that which is of the world. And so, give Lot credit. He was still able to discern the difference, and he was hot and bothered by it. And so we can ask ourselves, the things that I experienced here in Singapore, the things that clash with the values and principles, um, things that are important to God, does it bother me? Does it stir something within my conscience? Do I, I, do I experience an intention? Then that's a good sign. It is a sign of spiritual health. Because if you don't experience that intention, then it's a sign of you not being very healthy. It's kind of like uh, you losing the sensation in your skin because of some disease or injury. And so when you become numb, then you can't tell the difference between what is pleasure and pain. And so there is a symptom of the wicked who are spiritually numb and insensitive to the things of God. They're no longer able to discern. And so being able to discern the difference, and be able to be uh, bothered by it, and to uh, strive to be intentional in keeping a distance and not allowing things to devour you or your family, that is important. And so we see this, uh, and, and what is embedded here is a promise that God is able to keep and preserve the righteous. Yes, they will still have to be in the world. You still have to rub shoulders with the wicked, either in the marketplace or in the classroom or out in the streets, what have you. But God, and, and it can represent various trials and temptations, but God will give us sufficient grace to maintain our purity if we choose to align with God and to work in cooperation with Him through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And God is giving us that promise. And so it's important that we uh, keep that in mind. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm not saying Singapore is the new Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm not saying that at all. Uh, please, please don't uh, misunderstand that. This is true for any place you go, unless you find that you live out in the wilderness somewhere and there's no one else around. Any place that you go to, whether it's civilization, whether it's humanity, is always representing a threat to the purity of your faith in pursuit of being more and more like Christ. And so the bottom line is, do I, am I discerning enough to discern if there is a potential conflict of interest or a conflict of principles, if there's a potential clash in uh, values, of convictions, of, of beliefs, of things that we consider of a priority or of greater importance? Is anything that might turn me away from my devotion to the Lord and to His people and to the church? That that represents a danger that I need to stay clear of and be able to say, uh, I'm willing to do so, even though it may be pleasurable and enjoyable and even profitable, but, it does, but that's only in the worldly sense it profits me. But in the kingdom sense, it does not profit me. And I would, I would rather be spiritually rich than to be materially rich and be spiritually poor. And so can I make that distinction? And then we need to ask ourselves as we review this passage, 
What are my principles? What values do I hold close to my heart? What priorities do I have? Do I seek first his kingdom and his righteousness? And am I discerning enough to know that certain things that are coming to his teaching should hurt me, should trouble me? Am I discerning enough? Or have I gotten so used to it, I've become desensitized? And the only way to maintain that sensitivity is to return again and again to God's word. And to do what Peter did. And what did Peter do? He instructed his readers. He referred them to scripture, which was his writing. No doubt he interceded for them in prayer. And so there was mutual accountability and admonition. And so within the church, as we interact with each other on a regular basis, we need to hold each other accountable. We need to remind ourselves, this is of God, or this is not of God. In order to exhort one another to pursue his kingdom agenda and become more and more like Christ. And if we do that, we will remain true and steadfast by claiming God's promise that he will rescue us and protect us, just like he did Lot and Noah in days of old. And so, if we can be discerning in terms of what is true and what is false, then we would have fulfilled our stewardship and we would incur God's commendation rather than his condemnation. May this be true for us here at Bethlehem BP. So we pray. Lord, as we consider the words of Peter, that all prophecy is by your interpretation, not by the will of man or by man's whimsical interpretation, then we would know what the truth is. And as you have promised, we will know the truth, and the truth will set us free. Free from what is uh, false, what can lead to compromise of our integrity, of our, our, our purity, of our righteousness. Uh, free from the bondage of sin, and all the things that would uh, degrade and devour us. May we not only be discerning, but let us claim the promise that you are ever with us, to protect us, and provide us with the necessary resources stay true to you. And let's be mindful of our stewardship to um, hold each other accountable here with Bethlehem, that we would uh, be role models for one another, to encourage one another, to teach one another what is, what is this passage saying from God's perspective. And if we do, then truly we'll be light and salt here in Singapore and beyond his borders. It's in your name we pray. In closing, as I used to sing, be thou my vision.
to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>